Thank you very much, everyone, for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've been uh, having a great time the last few days. I feel like I've experienced about you know multiple seasons in three days. <laughs> so it's been great. Uh, you know, it's climate for you, or weather, or both. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is actually kind of a bit of a question, and you know, kind of trying to get you a little, you know, uh, on the edge of your seat, you know, is AI and machine learning in general going to completely revolutionize the way we do climate modeling? And so I'm going to be a little bit in the middle of that aisle, right? I'm, I'm going to say AI will be part of climate models in many different ways. I don't know exactly how, but it will be. Will it replace the full laws of physics? My prediction is no. But then invite me in a few years, I might be completely wrong or I might be out of job, by the way. So one way or another. Um, so I, I'm going to try to take you through a little bit of our journey on how we got to this point of thinking about AI uh, for climate models. And really comes from, you know, as Patrick mentioned, I'm, I'm a physical oceanographer. So I like to think about the ocean in the large scale system. So what I'm going to do here today is I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we use climate models as kind of the primary tool for climate projections. And here's a little map of a reconstruction of ocean warming in the past. And you can see it gets kind of, you, you can see a few blobs popping up in various places is where the ocean takes up heat, actually, and then transports it in the world. And it's been kind of this question that has been motivating us for quite a number of years now is trying to understand how the ocean takes up heat, how it moves it around, and how climate models actually help us determine what the future might look like. Now, one issue with climate models that I'm going to tell you about, and you know, probably many of you will work with climate models now, is we have the governing laws. So we have a bunch of equations that we're very proud of, right? So Newton's law, you can think about it, right? Force equal mass time, times acceleration. And we have them in a very complicated system that we care about. We have conservation of mass and, and so on and so forth. But the problem is we can't resolve all the necessary scales. So we take, take those equations and we basically chop them into pieces. And that's what a climate model is. We take the equation, chop them into pieces, but then those pieces are actually quite big. 
the about 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer horizontal resolution. I mean, everything that goes below that scale is actually unresolved, okay? And so now the question is, how do you actually represent those unresolved scale? Because we know the impact the large scale. And so the core of this talk will be, can we use machine learning to do that? And I'm gonna show you the pros and cons for it. For certain things, it does very, very well. For others, it doesn't. But also, I'm gonna try to argue that this is a way to actually, you know, poke certain questions that we've been, you know, thinking about for many decades, but coming at it with a different angle. And then, you know, the final question is, or the final kind of question mark is, you know, does it make sense? Does it help anything? And where are we at? And where we should go over the next decade or so? And so again, I'm gonna show you pros and cons. So Patrick mentioned a couple of efforts that I'm very privil privileged to be part of. So one is a science and technology center called LEAP, uh, so le learning the earth with artificial intelligence and, and physics, supported by NSF. Another one is M Squared Lines, which is funded by uh, Schmidt Futures. And so again, I'm here presenting and I'm, I'm delighted to do that, but I wanna acknowledge the you know, massive collaboration that again, I'm very privileged to be part of which is a lot of early career researchers uh, in particular that are really kind of driving most of the research. So, you know, we are across multiple institutions in the US and in France, really kind of try driving this effort. So their name will pop up depending on the type of work that, I, that I'm showing. But really they deserve, you know, all the cred credit and I get the blame obviously for anything that goes wrong uh, today. Okay, so main motivation really is you know, how the ocean takes up heat. So here's a, you know, a plot from the last IPCC report. This is energy change as a function of time. And this is basically a way to show you how, you know, the excess energy that we have in the climate system ends up in the ocean. So more than 90% of the excess energy in the climate system ends up in the ocean. And this is what you see here. Okay, so the land, the, uh, the atmosphere and the ice are very small heat capacity. Most of the excess energy ends up in the ocean. That means that you know, water expand creates a component of what we call thermostatic sea level rise. That's something that we can measure in various diff different ways, both by taking direct measurement of temperature, but also by looking at the imbalance of different fluxes. It gives us this indication that you know, the ocean is the primary reservoir of heat in the climate system. Now, if we look into the future, right? So as I mentioned in my kind of outline, we usually rely on climate models. So this is again a figure from the IPCC. Uh, so this is for the ocean chapter. So this is as a function of time. So the kind of greenish lines that you see here are the observations or kind of re or reconstructions of observations. So that tells us again, the ocean has been warming. Now the black curve is the ensemble mean of different climate models, right? So you're gonna have different centers that have their own climate models and they're gonna try to simulate the system both over the historical period and into the future. And so what you see here is that there is a gray shading here is because different models actually produce a different rate of change. Okay, and it's not hugely surprising, right? You have the same equations, but you're gonna break them down into some pieces, so you're gonna make some assumptions in there. And so there is a spread, but they all kind of feel the same thing, right? There is warming over the historical period. The rate is broadly consistent across the models. Um, and then when I look into the future, so different colors is a different emission scenario. All show warming because again, the ocean is gonna take up most of the excess heat in the climate system, but there is also a spread, meaning every single model will have a slightly different answer for the rate of warming. So we rely on those you know, climate simulators or those climate models, but what we can see is even for a given emission scenario, the models are giving us a different rate of ocean warming and also a different rate of sea level rise. So, you know, that's kind of a big question, right? We rely on those simulators, but there's some uncertainty associated with it. So where's the uncertainty coming from? Comes from, from the fact, again, that we have a system that has many, many, many scales. So I'm gonna focus only on the ocean here, right? So, and we're gonna go from small scale here to large scale over here. So most of the turbulence in the system actually ends up on, you know, scales of meters in the ocean. And then the large scale, so say, you know, the large scale circulation that is driven by winds and buoyancy and so on, is actually on thousands of kilometers. So if I wanna simulate the ocean currents, if I wanna simulate ocean heat uptake, then I really need to sim simulate this entire range of scales, okay? So that's for the spatial scale. Now they also move, you know, on, you know, from basically hours to thousands of years in many instances. So you need to really resolve 
many different length scale and many different time scale. So this is kind of the essence of multi-scale. Many scale to resolve, I need very large you know, simulation over many hundreds of years. And that's why we're a little bit stuck, right? So just to give you an idea, kind of like to make that little calculation. So if I were taking the equations of motions that actually describe all those scales, they, again, we have them, and I break them down into pieces that are one meter cube, meaning I will resolve this kind of dissipation scale where most of the mixing happen, then I will end up with 10 to the 28 equations to solve. So now try to solve that, right? It's just for the ocean for hundreds of years with large ensemble, right? So that's just basically impossible for us to do. So when we you know, come up with climate model, we end up with grid boxes that are actually much closer than that. They usually end up at this scale roughly of you know, between 10 and 100 kilometers. And anything that is happening below that scale is actually kind of an approximation of some kind. For the atmosphere, that would be clouds and mixing. For the ocean, that would be turbulence in all different scales. So just to, you know, I mean, nothing better than a movie, right, and then me talking at four o'clock. Um, so here are three simulations from the same climate model coming out of GFDL, so uh, modeling center in Princeton. And what, we, what we're seeing in those movies are surface temperature fields, okay? So the simulator has kind of, you know, outputted surface temperature out of those models. And the models are run at three different resolution. When I talk about resolution, I only talk about horizontal for now. Okay, I'm not gonna bother with vertical, but we can talk about it later. So, 10 kilometer resolution, uh, about 40 and 100 kilometers. And again, those scales over here, those resolution is roughly the typical resolution of our generation of climate models, right? So, super turbulent, so we are along Antarctica here, by the way, all right, we're along the Antarctic Peninsula. Lots of turbulence, lots of mixing, that has actually a pretty big impact on ocean ice interaction and the way you actually take up heat. And then when you go towards the left, then it gets uh, sluggish, viscous, pretty, you know, peanut butter-like, all right? So a lot less turbulence, and that means a lot of, you know, interactions between the small scale and the large scale that are not present. And so we need to come up with a ways to make the physics of this model as good as the physics of this one, but without increasing the computational cost and trying to represent as much as the physics as possible. Okay, so there are gonna be a few equations in here. I'm, I'm not gonna talk about them because I know the audience is, is pretty broad, but it's just to give you a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, an idea of what we're thinking about. So the key aspect here that we're trying to do, as I mentioned before, we're trying to get the physics of coarse resolution model as good as a high resolution without a computational cost. And this is not a new problem. It's been going on for many, many decades. Many people have done it. And the way to do that is to say, okay, everything that is happening below the grid box size of a climate model, as I said, you know, clouds of turbulence mixing in the ocean should be represented by what we call a parameterization or a closure. We're gonna come up with a function, a mathematical function that depends only on the large scale that will basically do the same thing as the scale that you don't resolve. And so one example is mixing, right? So let's say you have, you know, temperature, you, have two diff you are in a box of some kind, you have, you know, fluids of two different temperature. There's gonna be a lot of turbulence and a lot of mixing that are, that are gonna happen within that box. But you know that at the end of the day, what's gonna happen is, you know, the temperature will be, you know, somewhere in between the two fluids that you have. They would have mixed with one another and the end game at that scale will just be some kind of mixing that has lowered the temperature of one fluid and kind of you know, ra raised the temperature of the other. And that's this kind of effect that we're trying to capture. What the small scale are doing on the large scale without having to resolve them. So usually people come up with simple mathematical operator. So for, for mixing, a Laplacian will do, the, will do the trick for you. And then you just kind of make it up a little bit, right? So you have a coefficient in front that you can play with and tune to give you the right rate of mixing that you want. And that mixing will affect the large scale flow. And so that's the crux of parameterization. What is the effect of the scales that I don't resolve on the large scale? So then when I make a prediction of temperature, when I make a prediction of rainfall, it actually encapsulated the effect of the small scale physics without having to resolve them. All right, does that make sense? I'm fine with questions in the middle. I don't know if that's appropriate, but I think it's important. Yeah, is that right? Okay, people nod, that's good. All right, feel free to interrupt if there is something that you know, doesn't work out. Yeah, great question. So quite often you try to actually get the bulk, you know, of it. So you kind of average over many kind of time scales and snapshots and you definitely hope for the best. So your operator will change over time because it will depend on the large scale variable that can change. 
And then you have your parameter that can also change over time. But the way that's been done so far is, you know, it's a little bit ad hoc, right? Is, is that we're still trying to come up with something that is, we think is useful, but might change. And we know that, you know, those closures have been kind of a source of uncertainty in, in climate projection. So I'm gonna take the same example as I showed you before for heat uptake. So there are a lot of dots here, and just wanna give you kind of the bulk area here. So if you look at a climate model and look at the patterns of warming or the pattern of sea level change in climate models in the future, so it looks pretty red, basically sea level and warming are gonna happen everywhere as you increase greenhouse gases. But the pattern is different in different places. And if you take a slice, you know, in the Southern Ocean, and then look at what the different models are doing. So each one of the dots represents, you know, basically some, a different process in the climate model. And the black dot, uh, yeah, the black dot is the total rate of warming. So first thing, if you just look at the black dot, every single model gives you a different rate of warming. Okay, so that we saw that in the spread plot that I showed you before. Now the thing that is kind of interesting is, if you look at the other dots, so the blue, kind of bluish and then pinkish, each one of them is one of the processes that is not resolved in the climate model. It's actually a bunch of parameterization for mixing, some horizontal, some vertical, some you know, along what we call isopycnals. So lots of parameterization that we came up with are actually creating a lot of the spread in the rate of uptake in all those different models, but it also controls the rate of warming. So if I were to sum this up again, in climate models, we end up with a spread in the rate of warming. The spread in those regions is actually controlled by processes the climate model does not resolve. And in addition to that, those processes that are not resolved were represented by kind of, you know, approximation of what the physics should look like. And so those parameterization and those kind of ideas have been really there to kind of, you know, help the model, but at the end of the day, end up being, you know, kind of a source of uncertainty and creating part of the spread. So, can we do better, right? And that was the question. So, those parameterization have been amazing at improving climate models, but they remain a source of uncertainty. So, the question is, can we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to actually guide us in finding new ways to represent those processes? So, again, showing you the, you know, uh, faces of the, my many collaborators that you know have been part of this endeavor. So we're looking at using machine learning and high resolution simulation to represent those you know parameterizations in climate models. So here I'm only going to talk about the ocean. Um, again, you know it's a 45 minute talk, but we're looking also at um, you know atmospheric processes and sea ice as well and, and ocean ice interactions. So wide range of processes over which we're trying to reinvent, so to speak how to represent the effect of small scale on large scale. Okay, so the recipe, right, is for anything that is related to machine learning and AI, it's data, right? It's a data-driven way to approach a problem. So the first thing you have to do is to use data. So now, obviously, we're a little bit stuck, right? We don't have a huge amount of data, direct observations. So what we rely on is high-resolution simulation. So high fidelity simulation that we can, you know, run, uh, that will represent the scales that we care about. And then we're gonna extract some information from those high resolution simulation by kind of filtering them and kind of, you know, removing the part that we know and only focusing on the part that we don't know that we wanna put in the coarse resolution climate model that we're looking for. And we're gonna do that by using machine learning, okay? So we're gonna let the algorithm come up with a representation of those small scale that only depends on the large scale to give us a new parameterization of those unresolved processes. So again, I'm gonna focus on the ocean here, uh, but there are different ways to do it, right? So you can use black box machine learning, and I'm gonna show you an example, and they're great, because they have a bazillion number of parameters, so you can fit almost any complex function, and they're really good at capturing things. You can back in physics as well within them. And so for example, sometimes we, you know, add conservation laws within, you know, the algorithm to try to be constrained with the physics. And I'm also gonna show you other flavors of it where we actually learn equations directly from the data. So now we're not the first one doing that, all right? So it started quite some time ago, which is kind of amazing. If you think about it, it was actually in the late 90s where some of the kind of seminal papers came about. And it came from the atmospheric community in particular trying to actually emulate radiation. 
So, you know, we have the equations for radiation, but they're quite expensive in atmospheric model. So a lot of the original papers try to basically, you know, build a fast emulator of radiation so you don't need to recompute everything all the time. So a couple of seminal papers coming out, then about a decade of, you know, quiet. And then in the last few years, there's an absolute explosion of how to use, you know, machine learning to represent those processes. So clouds, warm rain processes, and so on and so forth, quite a lot of them. And again, as part of LEAP, there is a whole range of arrays of processes when it comes to, you know, ice sheet dynamics, you know, LC interaction, atmospheric convection, and so on and so forth. So a huge range of things. We've been focusing on the ocean. You know, things start, you know, to pop up, and there are more and more, you know, people kind of looking at those high resolution, you know, simulation to explore the range of parameterization, and hopefully I'm gonna give you a little bit of a flavor of that. So for people who are interested, so why am I focusing on this ocean turbulence problem? Always for the same reason, they're actually order one in setting the rate of heat uptake, and they're a large source of uncertainty in climate model. The other thing from a more nerdy aspect, from a kind of fluid turbulence aspect, is that the small scale interact together to basically influence the large scale. So this kind of what we call an inverse energy cascade, which is quite special to stratified turbulence that is quite different than other fluids. And so there's, there's this kind of interesting approach where, you know, if you don't resolve the small scale, you don't just impact something in your neighborhood, so to speak, but you can influence actually the large scale transport, both in the ocean and in the atmosphere, by the way. So I'm gonna focus on that. I'm gonna focus on the effect of those kind of eddies, turbulent eddies, 10 to 100 kilometers in scale, that can actually affect the large scale transport in the ocean and again the rate of heat and carbon uptake. Okay. So the first example is almost, you know, criticizing our own work and not my former postdoc, Arthur, it is amazing, but kind of to point at the great things machine learning can do and what it can't do. So here what we've done is, you know, the pretty simulation I showed you at the start, high resolution, right, resolve all those turbulent features. Can we use that data to learn what is missing from a coarse resolution model? And so the, what's missing from a coarse resolution model is something that looks like this, well, or like that if you want. It's very patchy, it's a lot of turbulence at kind of scales that is a bit larger than the resolution that you're looking at, but it's gonna have a pretty big influence on the flow. So the question is, given surface velocity at a coarse resolution scale, can we learn this kind of weird pattern? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use what's called a convolutional neural network doesn't really matter what it is. All it is, it's a, you know, a, a machine learning algorithm that's gonna have you know, lots of weights that it's gonna learn. Uh, it's gonna end up with a you know, few thousands of parameters. I think it's in this case, it's, it's something close to a couple of hundred thousand parameters. And it's gonna try to learn that relationship. Given a coarse velocity field, output what is missing in a coarse resolution climate model that you should put on the right hand side. No assumptions, no a priori. We let it learn based on the data. That's it. We don't ask for anything. In this case, we're trying to learn from a model that is 0.1 degree resolution to one that is 0.4, which is again the current generation of model at GFDL, so that was our target. If I look at the skill of what we learn, so this is what you end up with. So the skill goes from 50% to 100%, okay? So no matter what, it does at least 50% well, based only on four regions for which we give it input data, we can actually reconstruct the full missing forcing of a coarse resolution climate model. So that's pretty good, right? I mean, just you give it a little bit of data that you're trying to learn, you let the algorithm optimize for it, come up with you know, a function which has a lot of parameters, uh, and then you can basically reproduce the missing forcing with at least 50% skill in the full you know, climate model that you have. So now let's point at the things that it does poorly. So it does well almost everywhere. It does poorly near the ice, so near Greenland and Antarctica, right? And you can probably guess why. I give it data from four regions that have nothing to do with ocean ice interaction. It's only basically ocean interior point. So your algorithm 100% relies on the data that you give it. It cannot learn something that it hasn't seen, okay? or something that is not the same physics as you're trying to reproduce. So again, NL is not magic. It is data-driven, and all the data that you give it will actually dictate the output. And so that's kind of you know, a word of caution, because I know everybody wants to do machine learning, and I love it, 
but you very strongly constrained by the data. You can only learn based on the data that you have. Now, I was about to say a funny thing, but it's actually quite sad. If we take the same machine learning algorithm and try its skill in a model for which CO2 is increased, you can guess what happens, right? Actually, the scale goes up, mostly because most of the ice melts. So then you're fully exposed to the ocean, and you actually just do better, because now there is no more ice. So again, it's a bit of a sad story. But from a machine learning algorithm, it was kind of an interesting thing to see that the turbulence remained the same, and you expose more ocean, so your algorithm actually does quite well. So I still love deep learning. I still use it, because when you have very complex you know, patterns, it really can extract a lot of information for us and can really you know, do better than the conventional parameterization. The part I don't like about it is I have no idea why it did what it did. I don't know what it captured that I didn't know before. I don't know why it does so well. And so it comes to a bit of a philosophical argument here, which is almost you know, something I, I feel you know, very strongly about is how to use machine learning, right? And there are different ways to go about this. So if we're still in this problem of closures, the typical parameterization looks something like this, right? You have an operator that depends on the large scale, and then you have a parameter, and you don't exactly know what it is, and you try to fit it. And there are different ways to fit it, and you know, it can be a useful exercise. But usually, you, know, you have very few parameters, so it's, the complexity is actually quite low, which is great, because it's super interpretable. I know exactly what that does. It's just going to smooth temperature gradients, and that's easy. And the rate of smoothing is just given by the viscosity of the diffusion that you have. So from a physics perspective, it's, it's super simple. But the error is really large, right? As we mentioned before, those are large source of errors because they don't capture all the physics that you want. Now, if you go to the other range of complexity, deep learning, you know, again, a gazillion number of parameters. You can fit almost anything you want, but try to interpret something that has so many degrees of freedom, right? very hard to figure out why it did what it did. And so you end up in this range here where you increase the number of parameters so your error goes down, but interpretability, sadly, also went out the window. Very hard to interpret. So what we've been thinking about is trying to sit somewhere in the middle here. I don't want to be constrained by coming up with an expression with one parameter that I don't exactly know, and I'm not even sure if that's the right function to use. I don't want to be on this side here because it's too hard to interpret and I have too many parameters which probably don't generalize very well. Can I actually try to extract an equation directly from the data? So now I don't you know, basically dictate what the operator should be. I'm asking the algorithm to try to actually extract some information directly from the data and try to learn a mathematical expression for it. So it's still going to be the same problem of trying to learn this kind of missing physics from ocean physics, from ocean turbulence, for a coarse resolution model. But now, we're going to ask the algorithm for, to pick from the data a mathematical expression for it. So there are two aspects to it, right? It's easily interpretable, and it's kind of more flexible. And just from a physics perspective, it's also pretty exciting, because if you end up with an equation that has something new, then you can learn something about scale interaction that you might have not known before. So we have a couple of you know, studies in which we've done just that. So the first one was led by, um, you know, by, by one of my former PhD students, Tom Bolton, where we use uh, an algorithm that basically prunes a library of function. So this is a little bit of the schematic, right? It's always the same. You start with some input data at coarse resolution, or coarse, coarse end resolution, and you try to learn the subgrade ocean forcing that is missing from a coarse resolution model. And then you use an algorithm for which you can say, so for the first one here, what's called RVM, so it's basically a, what's called relevance uh, vector machine. So you're still trying to learn the subgrid forcing, so you're still trying to minimize the error, and you're trying to do that in a way that is as sparse as possible. So you want to capture only as few terms as you possibly can. And the algorithm is going to go through a set of library of functions that you give it. So say derivatives of first order, second order, you know, different multiplication of terms. Only things you feed it, right? It's not going to invent something. You're going to give it the library of function. And I should make one comment before I continue. When I say you give it, you have to calculate it from data, right? So it's, you take the data, you're going to calculate the first derivative, second derivative, and it's going to capture it from it, right? And so then you can prune this library of function, and you're going to extract an equation, or the best equation that represents this, this term that you're looking for. Second option is not to feed the library of function at all. 
you decide that you know, first you don't want to compute it or you don't want to bias your algorithm at all with it. And so one way to do that is to use what's called genetic programming. It's kind of an interesting way to calculate symbolically expressions. So you're gonna start with basically you know, a, a random seed. You're still gonna do the same thing. You're gonna try to learn this missing forcing over here by minimizing some expression. You're gonna force it to be as sparse as possible. And then what the algorithm is going to do is going to start a bunch of trees and it's going to add and multiply different terms together. And then based on you know, some skill score, it's going to kill part of the branches and then going to duplicate some other, literally kind of, you know, kind of replicating mutations and, and different part of evolution and, and genetic programming to actually get down to an equation that best, fe best feature data. So here's one expression we discovered. Don't worry, I'm not going to explain it. Um, but you can end up with basically a few number of terms that you can go and try to interpret. So you can actually try to understand what each one of those you know, extracted term tells you about the scale interaction in the physics. So now, no pre-described assumption about you know, what the physics should look like, what the scale interaction should look like. You let the algorithm figure it out by itself. And so for us, that's kind of an exciting way where you can extract new physics or new scale interaction just from the data itself. So here, again, what we could learn is something about you know, how momentum and energy kind of change within, you know, within those scales. Now the big question is, okay, you learn all those terms, and I told you I can learn from data a bunch of closures. Now the big question is, does it do anything when you actually plug it in your simulation, right? Because at the end of the day, if I do as bad as the best parameterization out there, then all I did is play a game, which is fine, right? Because you can learn something new, but the question is, do you improve your simulations? So we're gonna do that in an idealized test, and I'm gonna show you some results in, in kind of climate model code. So it's, those kind of simulations are a little bit of the bread and butter of you know, ocean turbulence uh, to try to understand the physics. So here you're at high resolution, you have a lot of turbulence. I think the screen doesn't do it justice, but you have a lot of turbulence here. Low resolution, so you're basically four times coarser than the high res, so again, it's less turbulent, but you have a little bit of that. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take you know, the, the PDE solver, so the, the model that gives me those two simulations, but I'm gonna run it at coarse resolution. And then on the right-hand side, I'm gonna run three simulations, one in which I'm gonna plug in the best physics parameterization that we know of. In number one, I'm gonna plug in a neural network, again, that I've learned on kind of this kind of filter type data. And in the third one, I'm gonna plug in the equation discovery one. So, so we have three sets. I'm just so showing you a snapshot. I'm gonna show you something more in a second. This is a physics space. This is the neural network one, and this is the one with the equation discovery. If you look at it, I mean, again, it's kind of hard to tell, but they kind of all look the same, right? I mean, you could say, I mean, great, they all do well. Fantastic. If you look at different metrics, right, rather than snapshots, some of them do better than others. So here is the amount of energy in the system as a function of time. The black is what we aim for, okay? So this is the high resolution one. The gray is what we try to improve upon, so that's the coarse resolution one. And you can see that the time series of the kinetic energy in those models kind of all reach the same level, roughly. So coarse resolution plus any of the parameterization get to the same point. But of course, they all do something slightly different. So the one with the neural net decide that it's time to go very fast, right? It seems to actually want to go extremely fast in getting to that turbulent state. It's mostly, again, because it's an algorithm. It didn't learn anything about the physics. It just learned that at the end of the day, I want to influence you know, the system with a certain amount of energy. So it shoot off quite fast. The other one, for example, do bad if I look at the probability distribution function of the main variables that I have in the system. The neural net does better than the sparse model and the physics one. So you can say, you know, depending on what you look like, well, one of them will do better than others. But the real test is, what if I try the same equations, but I change the physics a little bit? And so for us, when we change the physics, is we change what's called the, you know, the rate of change of the Coriolis parameter. So same physics, but what you end up with is jets. So the same equation, I just change a little something in my equation, but it's the same physics. So now, high resolution, lots of jets, low resolution, Okay, the jet looks better, actually, if you're on a real screen. There are a few of them, but they're really, really weak. Okay, and so now, if we plug in the physics-based parameterization, does not improve on the course resolution at all. If we take the deep learning one, it went crazy, right? It looks super turbulent like the old one, 
but technically it's supposed to have JET. And again, because it only learns on the data that you give it. So it's again kind of reinforcing the fact that you only learn what you see. And it's very hard to generalize outside. The equation discovery one, without retraining, without retuning, actually does almost perfectly on many metrics we look at. So learning from data a sparse model is not necessarily a strong constraint. It's actually a way to capture the essence of the physics that you're going after so that it can generalize in many different you know, simulation or different you know, cases of the world that we know it should work in. And, and this is something quite important, is you don't need something as complex as possible. Sometimes something simple is good enough to capture the right physics property. So I have a little summary, and then I'm going to show you a couple of you know, recent results that are not necessarily out, but how we use those kind of algorithms into the code of existing climate models. So first, I think, and it's kind of a prediction, but I might be wrong again, um, you know, parameterization of unresolved processes will remain in demand for, I don't want to say decades anymore because I'm always worried, but quite some time, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, it's true for the ocean, I think it's true for the atmosphere, for the ice, land, that's a given actually because there are no governing laws. So I think no matter what, we'll end up having to represent some scales for which we either don't have equations for or that we can't resolve in climate models. I think data-driven and machine learning is a way to go, um, you know, in addition to the kind of physics intuition that we have. And I showed you two examples. One is deep learning, lots of data, right? Flexible architecture, many, many parameters. You can do a lot of things with it. Can capture very complex relationship. High skill, is it generalizable and clear, right? There's a bit of a question mark. I put question mark interpretable because some people would argue that it's possible to interpret them, but I think it's harder because uh, it's actually quite complex, so you need to do a few steps. Equation discovery, as you can guess, I'm a little bit biased here. I really think you know, there is a way forward to capture the essence of, of or distill some information from data um, you know, in a way we haven't been used to before, but it's one way to poke at the physics um, you know, in a slightly different way. So it's quite interpretable, it's generalizable, it's very flexible. I'm going to show you four implementations in climate model. And of course, it can be a lot of fun because you might discover something you didn't know about before. And it's something we had for the turbulence problem. Now, there are many challenges ahead, right? I always, you know, I, I think when I say that, you know, which questions to ask, you know, people ask me, what do you mean? Well, everybody wants to use machine learning and AI because it's cool, but you can only use it for, you know, you can't use it for everything, right? So you need to have data. Data is everything. So make sure that you ask the right questions, you know, or pose the right problem because AI is not going to answer every single question. Again, seeing the past few months, I might be totally wrong. But anyway, something, something for us to think about again when we come from a physics perspective. And which data to trust, right? How do you make use of, the, of observations when you have very few of them? Now the last part is, you know, I showed you that in kind of idealized simulations and things like this, but when you put stuff in a real climate model, then many things can go wrong. And, you know, at all levels. So the first step usually when you do implementation in the climate model, you first want to put stuff in the code uh, and you want to not break the code and you want to run a simple simulation. And so I'm going to show you a few examples here on you know, what we did, what broke, what we kind of fixed, and what we don't know how to fix. So you've got the whole range of where we're going for. So here's a simple you know, ocean simulation. And what I mean simple is just a box, right? It's got a couple of layers in the ocean. And what you're looking at is sea surface height, right? So basically kind of the undulation of, of the sea surface. And it's in a box. So you can think if you squint really hard, you can think it's the North Atlantic and you have the Gulf Stream over here, all right? And that's what we're trying to represent. So now this is a run at 1 32nd of a resolution, of, uh, of a degree, sorry. And this is a coarse resolution at a quarter of a degree. What you can see obviously is that, you know, the jet, so the Gulf Stream, if you want, is actually weaker at coarse resolution. This weird, you know, turbulent feature there that is there forever, it's an, a time mean. And the question is, can I stick a parameterization in this coarse resolution model to give it the same kind of behavior as the high resolution without running the high res? So what we've done is we took the first parameterization that I showed you with the deep learning you know, uh, model. We didn't retrain. You know, we train it on data from a given model, and we stick it in a new model, and we run the whole thing forward. So this is what you get. It's a 50-member ensemble. is because that parameterization was stochastic, actually, so we could draw from, you know, uh, different realization of it. And again, you know, I can show you a different metric, but if you look at it by eye, then we look a lot closer to this than the old kind of coarse resolution model look like. 
right? So we took the course resolution, plug in the parameterization from deep learning, and we kind of improve on the jet. We remove these weird features that were stuck there. So again, very transferable parameterization from a given data set plugged into the code of a real ocean model. So this is the ocean model from GFDL, by the way. The equation discovery, very easy because we can code it up. And same thing, we take the course resolution, we put the parameterization in, and again, we kind of improve on the simulation. So we get the sea surface height pattern about right. We get the strength of the jet, which is the current for us about right. We get the patterns of sea level with the right variability. So we really improve on the course resolution simulation quite well with both ones. And so you could ask the question, am I lying, right? Is everything that simple? Of course it's not. So first thing is the more blew up as soon as we stick in the parameterization in. Because we learn everything from a given data set where, again, data doesn't know about the numerics of the model you're gonna plug it in. And so we still ended up having you know, to deal with stability issues. So the way we do it is by filtering actually the, the velocity fields and the flow fields that we put in. So there are many tricks that one has to do and something to think about because numerics might actually make things worse for us. Calibration and tuning. So at the end of the day, we come up with different parameterizations and we're gonna put them in a model and they're all gonna interact with one another. So it's very unlikely that we're that good uh, that we're not gonna create more problem or they're not gonna cancel each other out. So at the end of the day, you still end up having to do some tuning. How to do it, that's actually a big open question. How do you tune a couple climate model when you have many parameterization? I think, it's a, I think it's a big, big question that I know many of you are actually thinking about, but you know, there might be a role for ML here, but I don't know what it is yet. Computational cost and infrastructure. So I, didn't, I kept telling you, yeah, that's great. You know, we're gonna learn from data and we don't need to run at high resolution. But actually, the larger you know, the networks that you have, the more computational cost you have because you need to do an inference between, you know, between the machine learning parameterization that you have and your forward model. And so that's kind of you know, something we're working on. A lot of people are developing new tools to do it, but there's still a big question to it. Now, of course, that's why I like the equation discovery one because it's super cheap. Uh, you, I know exactly how to code it myself and you have one parameter, so there's no computational cost to it. And so that's a big plus. Now, of course, uh, we don't like to be stopped by anything. So we're still sticking that into a global one. Um, we have a few runs going on right now. The first one is actually a, a kind of a slightly simpler one where we only learn the vertical diffusivity of a given parameterization. So we're not replacing the full parameterization because we actually tr trust the one we had. And we implement a neural net uh, parameterization of the viscosity itself. And so this is the old parameterization. This is observations. And you're looking at the temperature gradient as a function of depth uh, along the equator, at a, you know, at a given spot along the equator. You can see those weird stuff happening in a model. Now let's take this parameterization and replace its vertical diffusivity coefficient with something that was learned from you know, machine learning and, and from basically data-driven you know, parameterization. You can see that a lot of the bias and a lot of the artifacts are done are gone, you know, the structure looks a lot better. And the model does not blow up either because um, it, it was actually well constrained in this way by just learning a coefficient. And so this is pretty exciting because, you know, we're getting closer to observations now by just learning part of the parameterization using data and, and machine learning and improving onto actually global models. And so this is in a full, you know, in a full um, ocean setup. Okay, so the last one I want to show you it's one that is also a little bit crazy, is that so right now, so far, we've been learning from high resolution simulations and you know, coming up with interpretable machine learning algorithm, you know, with those equation discovery. We put it in a climate model, hopefully we improve the models. Now, I haven't made use of observations at all, anywhere. And the problem is we don't have enough observations quite often. But one thing we've been trying to do is, well, observations are used to try to actually reconstruct you know, the past you know, few decades. So it's called data assimilation. And so if you work with atmospheric product, you know, what's called reanalysis and all this kind of stuff is a way to combine model and observations. So what we've been trying to think is, can we actually learn you know, part of the data assimilation correction to tell us something about wh what's missing from model error? And so that's one way to bring observations in. And so this is a bit of a convoluted way to do it, but I hope at least you'll get the gist of it. So we're looking at sea ice concentration now. So we are away from the ocean, still ocean ice interaction. 
So we're looking at sea ice concentration as a function of time. The blue line is a free running model. So initialize from a given set of observations, and then we let the model run. So it knows nothing about future observation, it does its business. The crosses up here are observations of sea ice concentration. So what you can see is, after the model is initialized very quickly, it moves away completely from the ops, right? Completely diverged from the truth. What reanalysis or data simulation does is, try to do a weighted average of the model and the observation and kind of stick the model back to a certain place that gets closer to the ops, and then let it run. And so now every time that you do this kind of correction and let it run, you really are saying something about how far the model is from the observation. So it tells you something about the model error itself. And the question is, can you learn that model error? And is that model error identical to the one if you were running your climate simulation for 30 years or 40 years? And for sea ice, it is. So this is the basically the data, sim that's the bias, sorry, from the simulation over two or three decades. And this is the correction that you see on those kind of five day time steps. And it's equal and opposite to the bias. So they're really mapping onto one another. How the model is being corrected on short time scale is actually reflective of the long term error of the simulation that you have in. And that works only if you, the process you're focusing on has a very, very fast response. So the question is, can we machine learn that and plug it into our simulation where we don't have observations and of course hope for the best? And so here is, you know, some runs from uh, Will Gregory at GFDL, where you want to see sea ice extent over time. And is it playing? Okay, there we go. So you're going to have the blue curve, which is the free-running model. The observations are this curve over here. Oh, I can't see the colors. The cyan one is the best you can do. It's going to be the assimilated part. And the red one is if you take the free-running model, you know nothing about the odds. You machine learn a correction from the past, and you basically do as well as the assimilation system within you know, a few errors. So that's one way for us to ingest some information coming from the OBS, but we don't have enough OBS to actually train on the whole set of observations, but it's a way to actually learn what the model is missing based on real data. And so that's kind of an exciting path for us, because I'm sure many of you work on you know, different aspects of the climate system, where we're data poor. And so that's one way to combine model data and machine learning together. Okay, so I have a couple of minutes left, so let me close with a few thoughts. So the first, and there are three quotes, and uh, hopefully kind of illustrate what I mean by this. So one that I'm sure many of you, you know, might have heard is the purpose of model is not to feed the data, but to sharpen the question. And you could say, well, I told you exactly the opposite, but I hope, you know, I can argue that I didn't really the way I see, I see data-driven method and machine learning is to poke at problems that are extremely important and kind of rethink the way we've been thinking about it and hopefully also improve on you know, simulation and understanding. So it's really a way to poke at things. It's one more tool in our bags of tools, right? And so I think that's quite important. And I think it comes down to the second quote, which you know, most people quite often say, oh, models are wrong, some models are useful, right? So it's, it's come from George Fox. The most that can be expected from any model is that it can supply a useful approximation to reality. And that's again, that's where I feel, you know, thinking about this hierarchy of model where you go with things that you can write with pen and paper or things that you can interrogate with data or big model is really the way we think about science in general. And so having this kind of bag of tools and model hierarchy is important. Machine learning and data-driven method are just one of them, one more in this kind of bag of tools. And that's my favorite one. Uh, it's not from a scientist, but a science fiction writer. Right? I have yet to see any problem, however complicated, which when looked at in the right way, did not become more complicated. And I thought this is the way I think you know, about the climate system. Every time I poke at something, I think I'm gonna make it simple when then it's 10 times more complicated than what I started with. And I think it's pretty common, right? And so again, we're very lucky to have you know, those kind of big projects and initiative where we have a lot of people coming at it at different angles, looking at the problem in very different ways. And so that's been very exciting to look at this very complex problem in this way. Of course, industry is also coming in, right? So NVIDIA and Google Research are also starting to think about how to blend you know, AI and climate modeling or weather modeling. So it's gonna be an interesting you know, arena to play in. And I think for a lot of the junior uh, you know, scientists in this room, I think your opportunities will actually be quite wide you know, when, when you graduate or when you move on to new jobs. I think there are a lot of opportunities there. 
And I said that a little bit as a joke, but I might be right. Maybe there's going to be a chat GPT for weather or climate or some version of it, right? I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that AI and data-driven method will be part of the future of climate models, one way or another, however we look at it. So I want to again leave you with those pictures. For those interested, we have a lot of things online, you know, basically uh, Jupyter books where we try to teach different methods with machine learning and climate models and a lot of code that is open source, a lot of our software. So if you're interested, you know, feel free to, you know, jump in and contribute or reach out to uh, people that have been doing all the amazing work. Thank you very much.